Cool. All right. Um, okay. So the first thing we're going to go over is writing a code into the starter project. I don't know if I actually saw anyone today doing that, uh, but I saw this a lot yesterday. Um, the idea with the starter project is you want to keep it as sanitized, as, as clean as possible, so whatever it was before. It's kind of like your, uh, think of it like your example you go back to to make sure everything works. Make sure at least your board is functioning properly. So copy the actual, copy the folder starter into another folder, probably start up, uh, start, probably be given the name starter parentheses copy, rename that to whatever lab you'd like. Uh, and that's where you should do all your lab assignments. Problem is I've seen people in the past, they will keep writing the code into starter. They'll either A, delete the previous code, or they'll keep infesting it with more and more stuff, and then it starts to interact with their lab. Like uh, some labs start to interact with other labs, causing a lot of problems. So just make sure they're in separate files or separate projects. Yeah, um, I don't think I had too many problems, at least when uh, the people I reviewed. Uh, but make sure you read the long descriptions. Kind of gives you more details into what is exactly required for the assignment. There's one for the next assignment that need to change. It basically says proper use of semaphores with no long description. And you kind of explain what that is. The basic idea here is that for semaphores, you'll have to use it in a specific way, and I'll describe it inside the long description. Make sure that you read all the descriptions whenever you are tackling that particular uh, um, requirement, and you should be good. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, this is actually not a problem with anyone in particular. This is actually something that I saw in some people's code. No one in here, actually, but uh, yesterday's class. I saw some people inverting the set and, um, and low, or sorry, set high, set low, to be inverted of each other, so that when you set high, it actually set the pin low. When you set um, low, you set the pin high, because the example on the GPIO uh, website got flipped somehow. So we need to fix that one. Well, it... It works for a normal LED. If you have an external LED, it does not work for a onboard LED. So I want you to set that. Another one. I don't know if anyone had a, a, a catastrophic issue like this before, but one individual ended up not being able to continue his work. He, did, he made some mistake and he couldn't. He couldn't. Uh, the code was working. Once you get something working, copy that hex file and just save it somewhere. Just keep it there so you can just do the demonstration. Uh, don't come in here, it would be really bad if you came in here and you weren't able to demo, demonstrate your stuff just because you wanted to add another feature. Um, and, if, and in general, just back up your code. So let's say you get one version and one requirement done, back that up. You can use Git, it must be private though. If it is public, then it's considered plagiarism. No one else is allowed um, access to it. Uh, but make sure you're backing up your code so that there's no case where you can't fall back to something else and get your points. You, you like, if you just say like, oh, I don't have anything, I can only really give you points for things that, that are kind of structural, but there are, a lot, there are a lot of points you try to get through demonstration. And that starts to increase as we go through more and more of these habits. Uh, and then there's one other case that I saw, I didn't see this today, but uh, putting all your code, all your implementation codes at the HPP. There is a proper way to do that. If you, took my, if you were in my internship, then you kind of know the way that I go about doing so. Uh, but I had some people who actually put it after the end if, and they caused them a lot of linking issues. If that ends up happening to you, um, note that you're supposed to put your implementation inside the CPP file, and you're supposed to put your header and other stuff like that into your HPP file. Any functions defined within your HPP file will be duplicated every single time you put them into a new file. Every time you run hash include whatever, it actually literally copies that code into your file. Once you've done that for multiple other files, when we link them all together, each one of them has their own implementation of set button high, set button low. And that can cause you to get linking issues. I can uh, give you linking errors. Um, so just make sure that uh, you're not running into any common mistakes with just syntax when it comes to uh, CPP files and HPP files. If I see them as we go through our, uh, through our, our demos, I'll alert you, like, this is actually the issue you're having right here. Okay. And you can also, if you have any issues with, your, with linking or like that, Put them on discussions, I can go in and help you out. Uh, don't try not to put any code, put errors there, but if you have any questions on that, you can post it there and I can get, uh, see if I can help you out. Or if you also know the answer, you can also help out your fellow students. Um, I'm trying to think what I saw today that was interesting. Um, I think it'll come back to me later. But these are the things that I caught before to make sure you guys don't fall into these, into these pitfalls. Now onto the real meat before we get started with the actual lecture. How to approach the design implementation. And there was one person who actually emailed me asking me like, hey dude, I am really confused by this. I'm kind of hit a roadblock. Uh, I don't really know what the next steps are I need to take. What should I do? And I explained to them in detail like, okay, here, like, here's the design approach you can go about to help you uh, get this thing working. And I think that was like yesterday. And the person got like full credit today by, using, by applying that same method. 
I went over this yesterday with my students, and I hope you guys can do the same method. Now, the first thing I'll start off with is after lecture, so now you understand how the material works, and after you've at least researched the requirements, you looked at the you looked at the requirements on on uh, Bookstack, you looked at the requirements on Canvas. What is the first thing you should do? First, first objective, first thing you should, you'll approach when designing this project or this assignment, because it's quite large. Hmm? Draw a picture. Sure, that can be a first step. Cool, cool. Okay, so let's say you draw on your picture. What would be after that? The GPIO assignment, yes, correct. Uh, how do you like commentate like what my code is gonna be like before actually Okay, okay. So what would you have written first? The first things you start writing out. Uh, the individual tasks that would have to run. Okay. So you start off with the individual tasks? Yeah. Um is there anything you could have done prior to make yourself more successful for the GPIO lab? Explain a little deeper what you mean by, by, uh, by writing the driver. Is there so, two ways you could take that? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you have to write the um, the class for your driver first, and then just write a simple program in main that just like you know turns a light on or something. That way you know that when you go to do your real program, it actually is working. And that's not the issue. Correct. There's a first step to a lot of things when it comes to designing a bigger project. And one of the first things you kind of want to do. I mean, kind of, one of the first things you need to do is, after you've done your research, is discovery. Gain some experience. One of the things that none of you guys have here is experience working with GPIO, for the most part. Some of you guys might have had some prior experience, but for those who don't, first thing you want to do is gain some. So the first thing you'll do is actually write out a, communicate with the registers directly, and write out a simple driver. Simply turn on LED. Is make sure that you can boot it up and turn on LED. You don't have to do any of the flickering stuff, you don't have to do a delay and blink it. Just simply turn on an LED. That is your step one. Once you feel comfortable with that, you see, okay, can I read from a switch? You read from a switch, great. Can I read from two switches, though? See if you can read from two switches. Think about this like a proof by induction. You take one step, then you do one of that step plus one, and then you should be able to get see the pattern there. You should be able to, do, you should be able to extrapolate to the, all the other steps. That is where you actually design your class. The first thing you should design is your driver in main or wherever you'd like. Make sure it's something as simple as possible. Have that, then you design your class. You start at the class first. A lot of things that you have to make sure that you're, there's two things that you're balancing at that point. You have a battle on two fronts. You have to then battle the fact that maybe the syntax of your class is messed up. Maybe you uh, forgot a, a break statement at a particular point, and now it's leaping into another statement, and it's causing other havoc for yourself. And then you also have to make sure that you're actually talking to the registers appropriately. So the part zero for this would have been to simply write the driver, to write the minimal amount to get the action for the purple they're trying to communicate with or trying to control working. Once you have that and you figure out the pattern, then design the class. What would be the next thing after that? So okay, so we designed the class, we have GPIO working, we can read from a switch, we can turn the LED on and off. Okay. Your next step was to try to attack the tasks requirement. Okay, cool, cool. So at this point, once you've gotten kind of a feel for it, you, you can kind of branch out at this point, and you can kind of start attacking each one of the individual requirements. So in this case, Zach decided that he wanted to attack the uh, tasks, uh, task, uh, the task requirement, and specifically the requirement for how to pass variables in. Awesome, awesome. What, what else after that? A couple of things you have to do. Another part of that um, that requirement is to be able to properly use those parameters. You pass them in, you got to use them. What next? I mean, if you have the parameters working inside each specific function, then at that point, you can just define the rest of it. Like, what is defining the rest of it? Um, okay, well, let's start with LED. Or 
Yeah, sorry, I'm going to start with the switch. You just um, you find the pin that is going to be moving, and then set this in play, and then you just do the intro, and then depending on how you tune it, you can uh, update it. So parameters shared by that switch function is in the LED. Yes, correct. Uh, to kind of paraphrase that a bit, you want to define your logic, the logic of each task, and how they work. Once you've defined the logic and you pass the parameters in, that's pretty much all there is for the tasks. And if you get those both working, then now you have the whole demonstration working. For the most part, you've got to test it out, but that should kind of work if you debug that portion there. I would actually even say that it would be necessary or useful for you to pull out the, uh, out the logic, do it in, its, in main on its own, and then put it into a task once you get the idea of like, okay, here's how I'm going to implement it. Because when you start putting them into different tasks, it can actually make things a bit more difficult when you have to have them communicate with each other. If they don't have them commit with the, communicate with each other, then at that point, you can probably put them into the task and it shouldn't be that big of a deal. So with all that, we started off with a GPIO basic implementation. Then we built a driver, we got that requirement out of the way. We got the logic out of the way, which means that now we have the demonstration. And just a note, you didn't have to have FreeRTOS working for the demonstration to get points for the demonstration. Demonstration was press a button, release it, LED toggles. Press, a bu press the external button, release it, that, but uh, that LED toggles. There's actually one case in here where someone actually did them separated in the sets. Uh, for the future, the application will only be all together. But for the most part, um, if you can demonstrate that you have the skill there, you'll get those points. So now we have the task. Um, we have the tasks, uh, the task law, uh, the demonstration project I'm done, and then we have the passing of parameters. Now we have the uh, the rest of the tasks uh, finished up. All the requirements are done. That is your process here. So the next time we see next week's assignment. Your first step's going to be, in this case it's interrupts, getting interrupts set up. The next step after that will be to then start attacking the different tasks and see which one you feel the most comfortable with. You see, oh, this one seems pretty easy. Go for that one. Go for the one that's easiest. Get that working. Get for the next one. And just go down to eventually get to the hardest one. The points are pretty well distributed. They're pretty even. So if you just go for the easier ones that you feel are easier, you'll have a better chance of getting the most points. Obviously, the objective is to get all the points. But if you can't get all the points, get as many as you absolutely can. Uh, one of the statements that I made yesterday was about the fact that I saw I had a couple of students who just had nothing. Because of the fact that they tried to do, write all the code all at once, tried to build that, and then tried testing that all, at, all together. And they had a hell of a time trying to get that to work. And they didn't get work at all. And that kind of scenario, it reminds me of when people come up to particular demos. Actually, this doesn't really happen too much at my work. But it reminds me of when people have demos. They try to do everything all at once, and they end up showing nothing at the demonstration. It doesn't look good when you go up to your executives and you show them the product that they're supposed to be waiting for, and you have nothing to show for it. It's fine if a couple features aren't there, but don't break the entire thing trying to shove everything all at once. So think about the value that you add when you're doing these assignments. Okay. Any questions on that? Yes. Send a message on Slack. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Send. Do not send a message on Slack. Send a message on Canvas, and uh, post about like, hey, like I'm I'm really stuck here. Uh, I'm trying to manipulate these registers. Not sure what happened here. Stuff like that. Although I find that the the question's a little too uh, pushing on to like you know like actually giving you like the answer. I'll probably give you some hints, or I might tell you like I'll I'll reply back to you in uh, in a direct message. But you guys should always default to sending me a uh, uh, a uh, a message in discussions. Although if it seems very particularly personal, or you're trying to send some files here and there, send those directly to me. Or to a Joss, you can send them to either one of us. Um, but I might point you to like a data sheet or say like, read this part here, this might be useful at this point, so on and so forth. Do you have like snippets of code in there? Just the discussion code? Uh, no, try to keep all snippets of code out of there. Just try to describe where you're, where you're going with it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that like I didn't really get what that was being used for, like in our code? Oh, it didn't have to be there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So it just deletes the task and the 
If your test never jumps out of its while loop, then it never deletes itself. Never, that's unused code. Okay. That's yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. I was like, is this somehow creating the while loop? No, no, no. So, uh, yeah, so the xtask delete within your code, it was inside the code example, right? So it's kind of, in a sense, a bit of a safety, and maybe I should probably just take that off. It shouldn't really even be there, because you'll, your, your code will crash otherwise. Your code will crash if you somehow jump out of your while loop and you return from your task. If you do SS delete and you return, that task just dies and it doesn't go, it never again um, runs. Um, but it's useful there if you do want your task to end up uh, terminating at some point. Yes? Uh, you didn't have to, but it'd be useful. Like, for example, you said you couldn't get it to work until you started talking over to the uh, a 7 minute display, right? Yeah. That was your delay, because it takes time to do that. Uh, but yeah, no, you can use VTAS delay uh, if, you, if you felt that was necessary. Is it the same as when you delay uh, or is it the same? Yes, so the question was, is it the same as doing, like, delay MS? And actually, no, they're very, they're different. They're the same in the fact that they have the same uh, effect. They end up delaying that task for some amount of time. But when we go into semaphores, bring this question up again, and I will explain to you the main difference between when you use delay MS versus VTAS delay. Make sure I'm charged up. Okay. Any other questions before we get started? Oh, can you turn on the uh, projector? I think it turned off. Look up tables. All right, so this little area right here is super useful. Uh, raise of hands, how many people have actually used lookup tables before? How many of you guys have heard of lookup tables before? Cool, awesome. I think I had anyone who did firmware for the internship here today. Yeah, no. so uh, I would have I would immediately. <laughs> We're not people. No. <laughs> uh, actually, you know what? Uh, let's see how well it's it, how visible it is, and we'll keep the lights on. I had one person give a comment about uh, them feeling a little sleepy and drowsy because of the um, uh, low lighting. Sure. Let me also just turn off. Also killing Slack. All of the, yes, uh, every single, I think for, um, yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure, certain. You can also double check this for me on the data sheet for the, L, uh, the user manual for the LPC 17XX uh, architecture, or I'm sorry, uh, set of chips. Those all should be a GPIO. You can also, they also have other functions, which will be going into, not in this lab, but the next lab afterward, is how we can switch the functions between different pins. Uh, but yeah, no, all of them can access GPIO if you want them to be. Cool. Look up tables. Oh, yes. Sorry, one more question. Yep. Um, I had trouble trying to get the search for what you did to find the pins. Is that what we were supposed to do there? Yes. So, the way I was doing the schematic, um, for example, if you switch zero, it would port one pin, not the other. Mm -hmm. But when I tried doing like a normal way to the LED, it just would not work. I'm not sure if that's really wrong or is there just a way to just do that? Uh, Actually, let's go, let's go, I'll answer this, keep that, like, write that down, and I'll answer this uh, when we're, like, at the lab assignment section. All right, look up tables. The objective of this is to go over how we can sacrifice storage space for runtime speed. 
So, what are lookup tables? Lookup tables are basically just static arrays that, su that sacrifice memory storage in place of a simple array uh, to be used as an index lookup. Um, usually they contain, um, almost always they'll contain some pre-calculated value that you can use to just say, I have this input, I get this output. Kind of like a hash table or a hash map or a gener generic map or a dictionary in Python um, or a JSON object in JavaScript if you know those languages. Oh, I was basically saying that like they are akin to a dictionary in Python or a, jo a, jo a JavaScript literal object in JS. Um, I'm not sure what they have for Ruby, but uh, it's basically a map, a key to a value pair. So you're like a hash. Correct, yes, like a hash map. Okay. So we're looking at a couple of examples to kind of see how they are useful. So why use lookup tables at all? Well, here's a simple example. We're going to convert a potentiometer voltage to an angle. Now let's make some assumptions about the system. So, we have an 8-bit ADC. What that just means is that we're able to read in a voltage, and the maximum amount of value that we can have is from 0 to 255. The potentiometer is linear. So if you were to sweep the voltage, or from sweep from one angle to one angle, from one to the one side, you would see it climb up and down depending on how you're sweeping it. It shouldn't ramp up or be logarithmic. The potentiometer angle sweeps from uh, 0 to 180 degrees. So on the left-hand side, it'll be 0 degrees. On the right-hand side, it'll be 180. These kind of details aren't super important, but kind of gives you an idea of what we're dealing with. And one of the key parts here is that we're working with a, a processor that does not have a floating point arithmetic unit like the chip that we're currently using, the LPC1756. So we have some code with, uh, uh, without a lookup. It is pot ADC to degrees, taking an ADC to value, it's a UN8, so it's only gonna be 0 0.25. Multiply it by a bit of a ratio to convert the, um, the maximum value that we can get from the ADC by the maximum uh, angle, actually it says 270, it should be say 180 the maximum degree that we can get from the potentiometer. Question here, how many instructions do you guys think this will take? Everyone here took 102, right? That's how you, got, that's how you guys got here, right? How many instructions do you think this will take? Give me a number. Uh, it does, it does take an operation, yeah. Or it, it'll, it'll, it'll take some operations, it may take a number of operations, but it is end up becoming Something that has to be done by the CPU. Four. Four? What, what, what instructions are you thinking about? Okay, so passing the ADC value, yeah. um, it would be 270 divided by 6, and then multiplying the casted ADC value by the resulting value. And then returning it altogether is probably like 24. Okay. Uh, there's a little more padding there, um, but that's pretty close. I like that one. Anyone else have any other uh, opposing ideas for this? That's good. Okay. So on four instruct four operations after you. No idea. What about you, Wyatt? Yeah. You just need like two to a certain degree, right? Okay. Because we get the phone. Uh, well, you have the casting, you have the calculation, you have the loading point, and then you have the constant, and you have the returning and all that. So I'm just wondering some loops over there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, that seems pretty fine. logical. I don't know if there's any loops in there, but. Uh, Yeah, it's a function there. It's not a function right there. Okay. Yeah. Is that function right there? I don't know about any looping, but yeah, no, you know. No, 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 no. But uh, yeah, we have we have a return, we got a casting, we got some multiplication, we got some division here. Um if you set your compiler to any optimization above uh, above like the lowest level, which is no optimization, you actually don't have to even do division. This part here will be taken care of by the compiler, it'll do the calculation for you, so you don't have to do it in uh, in, in code. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, that's correct. So you can. So if you were to implement this, let's say you had to do the work that the that the, that the compiler is going to do for you, how many structures do you think it'll take? That's pretty much the idea here. So you have to kind of come up with what structures that would be. 
And keep in mind that we're using ARM. If you guys don't know ARM, that's fine. It's pretty close to the MIPS if you're taking 140 right now. If you're not, it's fine. You just kind of use whatever architecture you know and kind of roll from there. It's mostly valid. You can get within a ballpark uh, uh, across the two, across whatever architecture you're thinking about. Okay, okay. So we got a couple of, we got a couple of options here. I heard 50, I heard four, I heard a lot. Um, let's move on, let's see what this ends up turning into. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you another example. So this is it with a lookup table. I do note that this is another way that you can uh, that you can actually initialize an array. Let me close this real quick. You can do brackets equals zero, and the reason why this is useful is just for the fact that you can easily look up to the left to say, okay, which key goes to which value. Is it okay for you guys to see? Okay. So for zero, we have zero. Uh, this will be the ADC value. It's it's constrained between zero and 255. And then this will be our angle, corresponding angle. So it goes to one, then to 2.1, then 3.6, uh, 3.16. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Have all your different values here. So we get up to 255. And there we go. And then our function declaration here, signed up a little bit. I put inline here. This is a bit of an optimization. Give you guys just a little hint on that one. Um, inline, what it does is whenever you call it, besides actually doing a function call, it'll just copy the contents of the function at the location where you called it. So it's a little bit useful. Uh, you need to be careful when you use this particular um, keyword. Because if you use it all over your code, all you're doing is increasing your binary size. It can actually make things, in, some, in certain cases, less optimal. Whereas using a normal function call can be better. Now, all this function does is take the array, plot the, eight, the value that's constrained between 0 and 255 into the, uh, into the lookup table, and then return that value. No calculations required, just returns it. How many structures do you think this is going to take? Yeah? No, uh, this is. Uh, this is in global space, so we just put it to the data section. The data section is pre-initialized by the compiler for you. So yeah, that, the setup of the array does not have to happen. This is already kind of done for you. And it will, there'll be another lecture where I'll go into uh, deeper into how the executable is structured to go deeper into uh, what kind of happens, what, like what, where this magic kind of happens. Uh, but Ari, you have a question? Uh, I was Googling it right now, but what is the inline keyword on a function? Oh, it means that every time you call this, Besides actually calling a function, a uh, quick voice of hands, how many people have taken 152 at this point or are taking it right now? Okay, so not too many people, okay. Uh, there are a couple steps that need to happen before you do a function call. And if you took 102, you should have gone over this, but you have the pre call. Oh, uh, yeah, you have the pre call, you have the uh, epilogue, which is the beginning of your function call where you initialize any variables you need to, pull any variables off the stack into a, into a register if you need to do that as well. You have the code that actually does the work. Then you have the epilogue that removes, uh, basically cleans up any code that you had, so it cleans up any global variables. And you have the post call, which is where you take the return value and put it into the variable you need to return it into. So that, that kind of happens every time you do a call. That's why we might want to use inline. Say, like, now we don't need to do all this call stuff, I just want you to run this right here. We'll return it to whatever variable it's going into. Now, how many instructions do you guys think? One instruction. One instruction. I might need a little more. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, this is already, the array is already in the type double, as you can kind of tell by these guys here. Do C++ functions like, like force cast the, like the return type into whatever you specify the return's going to be? Or if it's already in that format, does it just like do a cast? Great question. So uh, the question was, does C++ cast the return type for you when you return basically? And it can do an implicit return. Uh, what you may find when you try to run this on, uh, on the SJ dev environment is that I put some warnings for that. So in the event that you do end up returning, it'll put a warning saying, hey, you implicitly uh, uh, did a conversion between double to flipped. Um, or from like this int to this other int. And you might have lost precision there. There are some that actually will cause errors. Like for example, when you try to invalidly cast a pointer into an integer if you want to just get the value of what the address was, stuff like that. Uh, but in this particular case, there's no casting that actually happens. The array is already a double, and I am returning a double here. It's probably too like a big like, when you like, like call the geometry angles like as index ABC, 
Um, there's no real need to, uh, there will be one copy that'll just pretty much take like the information and return it into the, into the location where it needs to be for the caller to be able to see it. Um, but yeah, no, there's not too much, uh, uh there's not a lot of copying or by reference stuff here. Okay, I spoke to one. One? Okay. Uh, more than previous function. Oh, you say more than previous function. Okay, okay, so we got more than previous function. Anything else? I want to take. I want to get a third. How about you? What you say again? Miguel. Miguel. Well, how about you? Yeah, something? Yeah, are you looking? Are you looking at it? No, no, I'm looking. Okay, I mean, it's funny. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. okay, okay, okay. You know, I, was, I was thinking because like uh, the return that the, the address has to be computed first. Right? That is true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then it, it gets dereferenced at the location, and then it goes there and it's at the address that return. So if you consider the fact that the cache return there is probably on the stream of the calling function, so so to access that. Perfect, perfect. That's good, that's good. That was, that was actually an in-depth explanation to how you get the thing to work. And I'll move on to show you what this looks like. Lookup table disassembly ends up looking like. First thing we're gonna do, the main, all it did was like have a double and then try to return a double into it. So it ran the function, ran the function call. Well, the code that we had up there got trans, uh, transferred into just this. And all I did was ask for 15. So all it's got, because I put a whole bunch of literal values into it, it was able to say, no, I know exactly what values you're looking for. I allocate space for the variable. It's not included inside the function call. Then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put the value, this is kind of weird how ARM does this, from the PC, so it's actually embedded into the text of the program, over 12, put into R R3, um, load that in, this is actually the address that we're looking for, um, stores it into the stack pointer, so just storing the actual variable, and then we just loop at this point. So really it only took around like three instructions for the most part. There was a dereference, I'm sorry, there was a grabbing of the address. This was uh, dereferencing it, and then this was storing it inside of the inside the variable. So we only like two instructions. So you guys pretty much had it, right? The fact that I did inline is what reduced the amount of instructions that I had to do. Cool. Oh, um, that inline? It'll actually do a function call. We have another implementation of the function. So there'll be the passing of the variable, and then there's other stuff that works there. Um, so you'll see the, um, the pre-call, which is it, it's putting it on the putting it in the appropriate register, so it could be the first parameter. So Next, the whole thing it'll do some other work. It'll basically set up the parameter. It'll put it into the parameter. Okay. It'll put in the parameter. Then it'll call it. Then it'll make the space. Then it'll return so on and so forth. And then the return value will then put it be put to this guy. There's a couple other structures that goes in there, but it's not too far off from this. And if you're actually curious about how your code's being implemented, uh, this came from the .lst file inside your build folder. So you go into the build folder, go into binaries, you go into firmware.lst, you can see the entire implementation of all your firmware with your code in line with it, in line with it. You see how it's being implemented. I saw on the other hand somewhere. Yes? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, the Oh, it's not, because it's in line. No parameters are passed through, everything was the, the compiler, optimized, all that stuff happened. I had put in 15, so I did a function call for uh, pot two degrees. I put in 15. Since so I put the little number 15, it's like, why even call the function? Why even do any of that work? Just you like just grab the value from the array, throw it into the uh, throw it into the uh, into the uh, local variable. Cool. All righty. So now we're gonna move on to the other one. We're gonna move on to the multiplication one.
So it looks about right. You can see that this stuff's kind of happening. There's some retrieval here. And we'll move on a little bit further. You'll see. Now, there's, this is not exactly fair. This is not multiplication. This is actually division. Uh, so I'm doing a, a double floating point arithmetic for addition. But you'll kind of get and see the scope of this. Key thing is that we don't have a floating point unit. Got a couple instructions there. A couple instructions. A little more instructions. And that's quite a, quite a few instructions. And this keeps going for a bit. Keeps going. And there we go. Also, there are loops in here too. So, to do a simple like add 1.1 plus 0.1, that'll take this many instructions to do the addition. The storage is fine, very easy. But this, this is all that has to happen whenever you do floating point arithmetic on your, um, on your embedded platform. When you do not have a floating point unit, the SJ2 does have one. So it actually all becomes like basically a couple instructions. But in this particular case, you realize that, okay, well, I can't be waiting this much time to do a simple calculation. I need to be actually doing work. So that's when a lookup table will be really useful. A lot of times you're doing, little, you're doing some, uh, yes? In this case, this is O of this is O of one. This is an array. So the value that you you particularly set up set up your system. Uh, yeah. So you make sure that the way that your uh, your key value pair works. Uh, let's go back up. Works such that you can just throw the value into the uh, into the uh, brackets, and it'll event it'll give you the answer. But how do you compute the? Oh, you do that all on Excel. Okay. There are some uh, uh, higher level things you can do with C++ uh, fourteen and above to go into some bonus lecture if you guys are interested in that, where you can do all this pre-calculations and compile time calculations um, uh, and compile time, basically. But for this, uh, for this particular case, uh, I, would find, I would do this in Excel, copy-paste this into a text editor, make the array, copy-paste that into my code, and then that would be what I'd use. Oopsie-daisy. So this is not even the full code, because if I had to add an addition, I'm sorry, multiplication, division, there's more of these functions that are being generated. And this is quite a bit. Each one of these instructions is around 32 bits of space. And for each one of these, I could have just put this value into a lookup table and some double. That's 64 bits. I'm pretty sure having that entire mathematical expression inside my code costs more than how much space I wasted, uh, or how much space that I end up using up from my lookup table. So that's where you can start gauging where, in this case, I could have actually save space and time by using a lookup table. There's a lot of cases where you might end up saving uh, a bit of time, but we waste a lot of space. So you have to kind of compare the two. And this is one particular, yes? So in this case, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like Yes. Yes, that's correct. So yeah, this is, this is the case of like, uh, well, actually, in this particular case, you actually saved storage, you also saved time. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So in most general cases, you're trading space, uh, you're trading storage space, or the size that, that, you're, uh, that your program can actually get up to with speed. In this particular case, because of the number of, ex number of calculations that have to happen, and in fact, let's say my program is really small. All it did was just grab the value. All, all I wanted to do was uh, calculate that value. If all I had was just like that lookup, t like that lookup table and that ex that, uh, that uh, implementation versus having these functions here, I wish I would have actually saved more space by just doing going with the lookup table. The difference between the lookup table and this though is the fact that once this is put into your code, it's there and it's going to be reused for every single add double that comes up. Whereas you, have, you might have to make more and more uh, lookup tables for each thing you're trying to calculate. So it's not always a, a uh, like use this thing for everything. There are cases you have to think about whenever you're using them.
Um, so that's some other cases. So like you can, so you don't have to just use it for like that kind of calculation before. You could use it to calculate degrees to radians. As long as you do degrees in integers, you could just have a, a lookup table of uh, 360 values and then give the radians as an output. Uh, you could have a table of co and co, uh, co and cosines with certain types of degrees that you expect to come in. For example, if you know that you're gonna have to do some tr uh, some trigonometry work with a particular actuator or something like that, um, you may want to say, hey, I only know I'm gonna have integers coming in at this point. I wanna map those directly to a value because I don't have to do the calculation because my system cannot handle the one that floating point unit of arithmetic. And then there's one particular case where you could figure out the number of set bits within a 32-bit number with a lookup table rather than having to, well, I think the, what would be, the, besides going to lookup table uh, a version of this, if, you had, if I told you I need you to make an algorithm, I need you to tell me, I'll give you an integer 32 bits, it's not time. I want, you to, I want you to tell me how many bits are in there. How would you guys go about this? Without lookup table. Uh, no, no, how many bits are set? So you have a 32-bit number. How many bits are set to a one? And bit within one. And? Like what else happens with that? So if you and all bits with one, I mean you could and the whole thing with F, 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 and then that'll just give you the number you had before. How do you get the exact number of one bit set in there? Well, Perfect, exactly. Uh, what's, the, like, what's the number of iterations you have to do in this case? And how many is that? 32. 32, cool. So it takes 32 uh, loops in order to get there, two, 32 iterations to get there. But that's one way to do that with a lookup table. There's the example here. Found some Wikipedia, same mine. Um, the idea here is you have a lookup table where uh, you can put the number that you have, well, Obviously, if you want if you want to make a lookup table for every single 32-bit number, that would be insanity, correct? That would be uh, literally, uh, yeah, yeah, be four gigabytes of space. Well, actually, not four gigabytes of space. Um, actually, yeah, no, because each one of these could be a U at uh, 32. Uh, yeah, no, U at eight. I'm sorry, U at eight. So yeah, about four gigabytes of space. That's not practical. Which you can, yeah. Yeah, no, okay. If you got eight gigs of memory for your RAM, I mean, like, uh, I mean, it's no problem. Uh, actually, no, you need that for Flash, because you need to be able to store that into your executable. Or you can have your executable preload pre it on its own with the calculation, but then now I gotta waste time at the beginning of it. One well, optimization for both is to say, well, I don't need to look up every single value that ever existed. I can just look up s small partitions of it. So I'm gonna do it with eight bits. So what I can do, and write this out, is I can have a number. whole thing is going to be one 32-bit number. Josh, can you turn on the light cycle for this? Thank you. Purple underscore here is gonna go easier. So that's four sets of eight bits. What the algorithm does is it'll do the addition of x and it with 255. What that'll do is that will add this entire expression with one, 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 I just go one, 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 and these all become zeros at this point. So all that falls out is zero and then whatever this value was, correct? Correct? Yeah. Yep. Right. Cool. Yeah. So now I have 0, 0, 0, 0, underscore 1, 1, 1, 1. This value is 15. I take the bit set brackets. Put this number into this. This will index. This will index 15 out of this set. And all I had to do for the, uh, for the lookup table was say, all right, well, if I put in the number 0, there's no bit set. I put in the number 1, that has one bit set. I put in two, that's only one bit set though. For three, that's two ones. Four, so on and so forth. As put in the exact number for each eight bit number, how many bits are actually set for that particular number? So the answer will just, this thing will collapse into 15, 
I'm going to look up the value for 15, which will end up being, in this case, 4. Then do the same thing with all the other bits. I shift this entire thing over by 1, do the same AND operation, and then I put it into the lookup table again, and out comes the number of bits set for that 8-bit number. And do it for all 8-bit segments of the number, add those all together, and you have your results. Yes? Shift by 1 or shift by 8? Shift by 8. Got to shift, yeah, got to shift all these out, you got to shift all these ones out so you can get, yeah. Yes. See, you see a. Well, like, is it like having to and every like set of eight? Like, don't you have to individually and each bit so you're still like still thirty-two cycles? No, I only got to and four times. Right, but like in each and you're doing like you're comparing eight bits against eight bits. So that's have, correct. Does that only count as one cycle? Though? One operation. One yeah. stretch. That's, that's, that's one and operation. Okay. You can and multiple bits in parallel. Uh, uh, you were, uh, you're assuming return taking, are you, are you, have you taken 140 yet? No. Okay. We go into 140, you'll kind of get more of an understanding of uh, how that works with the CPU architecture. We have the entire one, uh, and operation just happens as well. So you just always end up getting individually handed, but it's all just one, uh, one ALU uh, arithmetic operation that happens. Kind of condition for, uh, in that case. So yeah, so we have four ands and three shifts and four, uh, sorry. Four ands, three shifts, and then four lookups. Whereas in the other case, we had 32 bits. Uh, we had 32 bits where we had to do an and and a shift for each one of those. So we had 32, basically 32 ands, shifts, and loads. I'm sorry, I have, actually, so there's no lookup here. I need for that. This is times two, 64. Where in here we only had around about um, eight, nine, 10, 11, 11, uh, 11 operations. Where we had 64 operations, uh, not, not including the comparisons either. Um, if I add in the comparisons, it gets even worse. Doubling this number of operations, then I can go to four bits. I don't have to go. I don't have to make like you know 256 bytes of memory to use up. I can just use up 16 of them, and I can that could that I sacrifice. I reduce my amount of space that I'm using. I sacrifice a little bit of runtime, but I would say that probably would be a better bet. And that becomes your option. That becomes uh, the way you can kind of choose between these. Uh, you could use 16. You could use 60. You could just dump 64k. I think your CPUs. This RAM that's on your board is 64K plus another 32K. So you, you just use up like almost the entirety of your code, uh, the entirety of your um, RAM at that point. So, yeah. I saw a hand from somewhere over here. The yes. Was only eight bits in this case, right? It's only 8 bits in this case. And then, uh, Terrence, do you have a question? No, no, no. So, so what I was saying was, if you made this, like, a, the, like, so, if I'm going to use this for an 8-bit number, and I want to be able to hold all possible 8-bit numbers, I have to make this 256, the maximum set of numbers that can, that, not, maximum set of combinations that you can get uh, for an 8-bit number. If I made it 32 bits, and I wanted to have every single combination, so I can just look it up once, not do any of, the, any of these other operations. That'll take four gigabytes, 4.6 gigabytes worth of space to do. Well, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you wouldn't want it. Yes? Why do you say four gigabytes? I don't know where you're getting that. What's two to the 32? Ooh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Any other questions about this one? Anyone else kind of confused at all? Seem good? Cool. Alrighty.
So there are way more uses of lookup tables than this. Uh, but there's one other cool one that you're actually going to be utilizing for your lab assignment. And that'll be lookup table as the decision tree. Uh, this is kind of an elegant way to go about this. So for example, let's look at how we can replace the decision tree with a lookup table. But first, let's think of a particular scenario. We have Robit. All right? We have a robot that has to make a decision. And it has two inputs that it can react to. A bool for power systems nominal and another bool for obstacles ahead. If the power systems are nominal and there's obstacles ahead of us, keep moving forward. Just keep going. Move forward. If the power systems are not nominal, uh, I'm sorry, are nominal, but there's no there is an obstacle ahead of you, move out of the way. If your power systems are not nominal, there's no obstacles ahead of you, so you can slow down. Maybe you're charging too fast and the battery's starting to drain a little too quickly. You've seen the dip. You want to slow down a little bit. You're using up too much power. But in the case where both of these are both, the power systems are not nominal, and uh, there is an obstacle ahead of you, we want to do an emergency stop. Power's not, power's starting to fail, and we have obstacles around us, we just want to quit, we don't want to do anything else, we just want to stop here. See that make sense? Cool. Interesting little thing though, this looks a lot like a, look, this looks a, lot like a truth table. So I'm going to bring back some 124 to haunt you guys. So what we have here is a true table where we can think of nominal as A and obstacles ahead as B. So we have A, B, F. F is the decision we will make. And I'm going to this is kind of inverted a bit. It's based off the thing above, which is 1, 1. Then it goes 1, 0, then 0, 1, and then 0, 0. Okay. Then we have move forward, then we have move out of the way, and so on and so forth. We have these two values that can allow us to look up exactly which thing we need to do. What we can do is we can construct a decision matrix. Okay. So I have these functions somewhere in my code. Uh, if you guys have not seen this construct before, this is called a function pointer. Give you guys a bit of uh, uh, some details into this. You, you, when you make a variable that can hold a, an address of a function, you'll specify its return type. Um, you will pre you'll specify parentheses around this and asterisk. This is the declaration of a function pointer. You'll have the name of the variable itself. Then you'll have parentheses here to specify what variables you take in. In this case, void doesn't take any. If it was going to take in int or bool, you put bool here, or int or bool. If you have multiple, you just do a common delimited. And to wrap it all up, I want, I want to also make this into an array so I can have an array of uh, function pointers. Okay? So it's an array of addresses for the most part. Somewhere above my code, I've defined move forward, move out of the way, slow down, emergency stop. And I can set that. The, the index 1 and 1 is equal to this address. Same thing with this address and this one and this one. So you can think of this as the first item as being the uh, as being the row, and the other item as being the column. However, you like to think about your matrices. The cool thing about this is, in order to make my decision, I don't have to do what was it three comparisons, and each one of them had to compare two items. I can now simply just let math take care of it for me. Put the bool into this location here. Put that bool into this location here. Specify the name decision matrix. And it off with parentheses, and that will call the corresponding function. Ah. And let's say they have like a much bigger one. Let's say you have like let's say uh, five different uh, five different items. You could do all the different decisions for all those, or you put it into one of these. There are times when you'll see that you're doing a whole bunch of if else statements back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, or a large switch case. And a lot of times, it may be a way to you may be able to optimize your code and use lookup table. Uh, raise your hands. How many of you guys, when you, uh, there was a couple people who did the extra credit, and if you did the extra credit, how many of you guys used uh, if else statements or switch case statements to determine which register you're going to point to? Cool, cool. Um, one other alternative would have been to make an array of the GPIO type defs, put each one of the registers as each one of the indexes, 
record the port number. You guys, actually, I think almost every, a lot of people did this if you did the multi uh, the multiple um, multi implementation, and then just look up the uh, look up the register that you're looking for, and that will reduce all the switch cases. So you don't have to re-implement and recode the same thing over and over and over again. So you don't have the case of where oh you know like for some reason my port two doesn't work, but my port one and zero work. And you're looking at code. Ah, oh, right, because I messed up on the implementation of how I did case two for that one. I didn't put the or that I put an equal statement. Okay, I'll make sure not to make the mistake again. Or you can omit having to do all that extra code and just do it as a lookup table. So those are like the two big usages, uh, use cases for lookup tables, in my opinion, for for this class and for uh, what you'll be doing for your assignment. Key little thing: this pattern of lookup table will be most useful for us um, for the interrupt uh, for the interrupt lab uh, assignment. So basically, this will be used for the lab assignment. Any questions about lookup tables at this point? After this, we're going to take a bio break. Yeah, sure. Just can you do me a favor? Can you see how much uh, time, like how much space is on the uh, card? It should be on the top. Should see like uh, uh, a number dot number g. That should be the amount of space that's left over. Okay. So we have this guy here. Um, I wanted to make. This is it, Josh? Point nine. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, um, I'll make a slightly uh, simplified version of this where we don't have a matrix, we just have like a single value. So let's say I have um, uh, two functions, two operations I want to do. And let's say one of them is like int sub for subtract, and it takes an int a and an int, y'all can't see that, can you? I'm going to move it to the other side. Int sub takes an int a, int b, and I guess I understand what it's going to do, so I'm not going to write that out. And it returns uh, like the subtraction of these two. We have another one called add, and it does the addition of these two. I'm not going to write that out. You guys can kind of figure that part out for yourselves. That's the addition of these. Um, one thing I can do let's say I want to, on the fly, change up which operation I'm doing on a particular set of numbers. What I could do is say, well, I can have int operation, int, int, and then to say this is equal to, let's say by default, sub. Default to subtracting the numbers. At some later time, I can then say equal to add. And then we'll start calling the add function each time I try to call this one. So if I want to call this, I will simply just call operation, operation, I don't know, let's say five and two. If I want to run this, now, depending on what I set it to prior, it will run one of these operations. Now, there is some weirdness here. You think like, okay, what's up with these little parentheses here? Why are these here? Problem with this is that if you remove the parentheses, and you kind of ignore this area here. What does that kind of look like? Looks like a normal pointer, right? Yeah, so it looks like a pointer. The compiler can't do a really good job of figuring out if that's a pointer or not. Um, and it has to do some deduction in order to figure that out. And in order to make the compile time uh, faster, rather than trying to deduce, okay, is this a function pointer or not, what you simply could do is just force the user to have to put in some new syntax. In this case, you have to put parentheses around uh, the label as well as the uh, the asterisk in order to define this as a function pointer. And you specify this guy here. It also gets a little bit worse. Um, I'm going to remove it one more time. I'm going to ask you, I don't want to include this part here. What does that kind of look like the start of? Not constructor. I'll make, I'll make it a little easier. Let's do this. A. What does that look like? It's like a function. And what does this function return? In terms of integer pointer. So like the reason why we actually have these parentheses here is so that we can't, so that we don't get mixed up with whether or not it's a pointer or a function declaration. So we put those there, and that's how that's that's how we distinguish between them. Make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions before we go on bio break? Cool, awesome. All right, so you guys have uh, five minutes. Um, uh, uh, 
Well, let's see, yeah, go, come back at 48 and yeah, get a, get a bathroom, get some to drink, do whatever. Move on to binary sum of fours. All right, so you guys might have heard of semaphores in the past. There are three types of semaphores. There's the binary semaphore, the counting semaphore, and the mutex. Right now we're going to go into binary semaphores. Uh, the one thing you should really be using semaphores for is for signaling and synchronization. There are other uses, like for example, there are semaphores that can be used for protecting resources. That is the mutex. Do not use these for those. Got to get a little bit into it. We're going to look at a couple of design patterns. So right now we're going to go to the first design pattern, which is the, uh, the wake up on semaphore. Think of the semaphore as an event, like a flag, like, hey, I want you to wake up. I need you to do some work. Think about when it's about noon. Your mom comes into your room saying, hey, you need to clean up. Your mom's a semaphore in this case. She's the signal that wakes you up and tells you you need to do some work. Where before, where prior, you were sleeping. The interesting thing about the semaphore and yourself is the fact that in this particular case here, so let me go into this little for a sec. We have the weight on semaphore, then we have the semaphore supplier. Up here, we have defined the semaphore handler. And here we have two tasks, whereas one of them will give a semaphore and the other one will take a semaphore. Think of t giving as being able to supply a signal saying, I'm initiating the signal and taking the symbol, signal as a way to consume it. This one here basically just checks to see if a button has been initiated. And when it gets pressed, it will fire the semaphore. This other task, when it began, when it begun, I had a while loop here, its first thing was to try to wait on the semaphore, try to wait on the signal. You give it the handler, like what the name of the semaphore is, or the semaphore variable in this case. Then you give it a max delay. You give it a delay that you want. And this delay is in the number of ticks that your OS is set to. What we talked about before is that the OS ticks you have for the SGA1 board is set to one millisecond. So you put 1,000 here, you're going to wait 1,000 milliseconds before you move on. If you put port max delay, though, it pretty much states, wait forever. Do not stop waiting. When this is finally given, these, the operating system will context switch back over to the wait on semaphore, and continue down this line. It allows us to pass. You may see this if statement here. You might think, like, what's the purpose of this statement? Well, if you did put a number here saying, I want, like, let's say, 1,000, what you could do is you could actually see if this thing returns true or false. If it returns false, that means that you actually didn't get a semaphore or you, or you timed out. If it's true, that means that uh, you didn't back get a semaphore and run this function, or sorry, run this uh, procedure. Is it flock. Now, there's one particularly interesting thing about the semaphore that makes it better than pulling on a variable. Because I'm pretty sure everyone here had to pull on some variable in order to wait for them to go in. Uh, when you press a button, set a flag, and then you press another button to release. You had to wait to see if that flag would change before you toggled the LED, correct? OK. The problem with this is that at all moments and all times, each one of these tasks is running. The task that you had to read was continuously reading until its time slice was run, and then was moved over to another task where it continuously read or continuously read. You could have put a delay in there to say, hey, I want to sleep now. But for that duration before that happened, you had to kind of wait on a particular signal. And that's a waste of cycles for the most part. Why waste cycles when you can just not waste any at all? When you are waiting to take the semaphore, this task goes from the ready state to the blocked state. Remember on the first lecture when I went over like the rule for free RTOS? What was the rule for free RTOS? The one rule for free RTOS. Don't talk about free RTOS. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's rule, okay, yes, that's rule one of free RTOS. What is rule two of free RTOS? Don't talk about free RTOS. All right. <laughs> I don't remember what rules you were. I really wasn't rules. <laughs> yes? Did you refer to it as a scheduler? So it helps the reason that I have a lot of things that work like kind of like a prior reason. Okay. 
So what was the rule based off that 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 the, the behavior of a scheduler? What is what is that rule? All right, if you're looking it up, what else? Oh, it's in my notes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> highest priority task always runs. Highest priority task always runs. I got one other word in there. It's highest priority high, highest priority ready task runs. So there are multiple states that a task can be in. It can be suspended. It can be ready. It can be running. It could be blocked. Those are the four states. If you're currently running the task, obviously you're running. To repeat, you can be, and you actually can find this on the on the uh, on the uh, Fair Task website, like what are the states for a task. You can either be ready, you can be running, you can be blocked, you can be suspended. Suspended only happens when you run the v suspend task and you give it the task that you want to suspend, and then it just gets put into suspension and never runs until someone runs a resume on it. When it's blocked, it means that it's waiting for something. In this case, we're waiting for a semaphore. In the future, we'll wait on mutexes. In the future, we'll wait on queues. There'll be other operating system constructs that we can wait on. In this particular case, we're waiting on a semaphore. But when we are blocked, the schedule will say, okay, and the list of all ready tasks, which one do I want to run? Since this task is blocked, it will not be in that set. So this one will not run at all. That's where this becomes optimal. The only task in this case will ever run will be this task here. The only time this task ever runs, oops, every time this task ever runs, is when the semaphore has been admitted. Okay? So let's say you had, let's say, um, like 10 tasks, each with their own semaphore that they're waiting for, and they're all just stuck in their waiting and they're waiting for the semaphore to, to, uh, to pass through. In that particular case, uh, when, uh, if you only have one task that's gonna set each one of those semaphores, you have to wait for each one of those to happen before that one will be run. So there'll only be one task running for that entire, for that entire application. 10, uh, let's say 11 tasks, yes? No, it never scheduled. It never run. Okay. So, where does it get placed in the operating system? That's oh, uh, same place it was before. So, in the place of the operating system, it, there's a list of all the tasks. And for that particular task, it says I'm blocked. In which case, it won't even consider it for the operation of which one do I choose to run next. Okay. So, does each set of four then have like a like, waiting task linked to it? Uh, the operating system knows which tasks are blocked for which semaphores, so it kind of holds that information. Semaphores themselves do not hold that, but yes, it, that information is known to the operating system. So the more semaphores you have that are waiting on different things, the operating system will say, okay, once this one's given, what it'll do is it'll say, all right, this particular semaphore goes to this task here. I'm now going to give this, I'm going to allow it to take the semaphore, allow it to take the semaphore, consume it. That task will then be moved from blocked to ready. Then I'm going to reevaluate the uh, the rule. Is the highest priority ready task running? If this was highest priority, then this one will begin to run. If it is no longer highest priority, if it was not highest priority, and there's some other task that's running, then it'll run over it until this guy gets time to actually run. Yes? So then would it be like normal practice to put the, the waiting task a higher priority than the supplier task? So that as soon as it uh, gives a semaphore, it immediately contacts switches to the, the, the uh, consumer? That could be what, if, if that is desirable for you, yes. Okay. There could be cases where you want to give it, you want to emit a signal, but it doesn't really matter timeliness when it happens. Okay. So I know that, like, you know, at some point when it gets time, it, you should go do this. Okay. It's kind of like, you know, I can tell you, like, pat you on the side and say, hey, I, I need you to go take out the trash, or I need you to uh, go work on this one assignment for me, and I'm not telling you to do it right now. Uh, it's not the highest priority thing, but you do know that you need to do it once time is a lot for you. One little uh, key thing here. If you have multiple tasks waiting on the same semaphore, it can only be consumed once. So semaphore really only has the state of taken or given, or given or taken. So if you have five tasks, the schedule will kind of look at the first one it sees and says, yeah, I'll give it to you, and that won't continue to go. So it's undefined if your tasks have all the same priority for ones that are trying to take the semaphore, which one will get to run. So in this particular case, this is a this would not be useful when you're trying to broadcast information to multiple tasks. 
There are other obvious and constructs that can help you out with that. And we'll go into that actually, I think, near the second to last, second to last, oh no, actually the last assignment, we'll go into that. Yes? So for max delay, is that the amount of time it waits before it samples to, uh, what's the, sorry, what is port max delay compared? This specifies that I want to wait forever. Uh, but let's say this was not Pro-Max delay, let's say, let's say it was like 1,000, 1,000 milliseconds. Yeah. Basically what happens is uh, there's a timer that kind of ticks over. So every time the operating system gets called uh, for each tick, it'll continually check and say, okay, subtract one, subtract one, subtract one, until eventually this thing hits zero. If it hits zero, this guy moves automatically from blocked to ready, and then mm -hmm. the, uh, the schedule will decide if it wants to run it. Okay. Any other questions? So that is the wait on semaphore design pattern. Oh, and then here, uh, one of the things you have to do in order to initialize your, um, your semaphore is to do x semaphore create binary. Uh, there's another one for x semaphore create mutex and so on and so forth. But for this case, we'll just use the x create binary. Uh, in this case, we're just specifying the different values we want for our tasks. In this case, we have equal task priority for both. Another design pattern is to use it as a flat. So in this case, I don't actually want to wait at all. I just want to check it and see if it's set and then go. So simply, if x semaphore take x semaphore, I put zero there. So I don't want to wait. I just want to check it. And if, that's, if it's all good, move on. And if I have it, run on. If I don't, don't run this um, statement. Simple as that. Any questions on this one? It's similar, so you can think about it as, as, um, as a, uh, actually a really good example would be a bathroom pass. You only just one bathroom pass, okay? So if someone says, hey, I need to use the bathroom, I go and give them the bathroom pass. It has now been occupied or it's been taken up, it's been used up. The thing with this though, well, the bathroom pass is a bad example because in this case, I'd have to have like a, like a um, kind of like a ticket for each person. For example, like I would give you a bathroom pass and then you go and go to the bathroom, and I'll give you a different bathroom pass, you can go to the bathroom. It's kind of like a ticket in a sense. Okay. Uh, but once I give it to you, you now own it, you now have consumed it, it's now gone for the most part, And we're, as, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Any questions on this? So that one more like follows like a, like a Boolean flag rather than like a... Correct. Yes? So I assume at some other point in that code, there's going to be um, another command where it gives a sim four back. Correct. Yes, yes, yes. The thing is assuming that we had the previous code up there. Um, some students in the past have asked me, well, why not use a bool here? Why, why even use a semaphore? Well, the purpose of using the semaphore is the fact that uh, it is an operating system construct. So it will have to pass through the operating system in order to work properly. There are some cases where you actually don't, we don't even need to use a semaphore. You can just use a bool, um, that could be fine. Uh, but there are some thread safety reasons for why you'd want to use a semaphore over mutex. I'm sorry, a semaphore over like a bool or another type of uh, data structure or another type of primitive value. What do you mean it passes through the operating system? So when this guy gets called, the operating system gets a, you go you move back into the context of the operating system. The operating system now has control and now gets to decide, okay, what value was I given? Got the semaphore, and they can make its judgments there. So if it wanted to, it can context switch you on the spot right there. Either out or in, depends on what it wants to do. Um, the thing is, this particular call is thread safe. Just so you guys know for now, we'll go into deeper into what it means to be thread safe when we hit the mutexes. But for now, just know that the reason why we use semaphores over using bools is that these guys are thread safe. They do have more overhead though. A bool would just simply be get the value, use it. In this case, we have to do a function call. Arms just have to get in, the operator system has to get involved. Some of the things happen. And the last thing we're going to go into for, uh, for interrupts is the uh, interrupt from ISR. So if you're, in a, if you're in an interrupt, the context that you're in is different from the realm that FreeRTOS runs in. In this, in this particular situation, you need to pass the um, semaphore from ISR. That's what this little extension here is from. It's basically the, the appropriate call when you're, from, when you're within an interrupt. If you're, out, if you're within a task, use the normal x semaphore give. If you're with an interrupt, use the X semaphore give from ISR. Um, I'll go into probably a little later after we get through the interrupts um, why it is that we don't want to use the normal X semaphore. 
And then you can have one task that's waiting on it. So in this particular case, when you write an ISR, you want to make it as simple and as small as possible. Um, and in doing so, we could have it just be a one-liner. And then we can have some task implement whatever work the ISR is supposed to do. So let's say you have a, a, a button that's supposed to do an emergency stop. Rather than writing the emergency stop logic in here, we can write it inside the task. Any questions on that? Oh, uh, yes, question? Uh, why do you want your ISR to be as short as possible? We're about to go into that. Yeah. All right. Control. All right. Nested vector interrupt control is so. So basically, uh, recap real quick. What is an interrupt? You guys are familiar with the concept and still, but how it actually works is that an interrupt is a hardware signal. So it goes a little bit beyond the software. And it um, allows you, like it suggests, to break up your task or to stop your task and to do something that's more immediate or more like emergency type of thing. So rather than a semaphore, it's like he's, uh, Khalil said earlier, it's like whenever you want to do it, it's like you got to do this now. This is going to happen in the middle of your task. It will, um, what happens is the CPU, and we'll get into a little bit later, will interrupt the task and uh, do the interrupt service routine. And the way we do that, uh, we'll explain later. But Know that each of your peripherals has the capability to uh, have interrupts. Your GPIOs, even your ADCs, all have the capability to be interrupt enabled or interrupt driven. And here's the basic procedure of what happens when an interrupt gets fired off. So the CPU um, tells the program counter to jump to the ISR, wherever that's located. And during that time, that's when it gives the return address, right? Yeah. Okay, so you save the return address, kind of like in um, 140, how you did the jump instruction. You save the return address, and then you jump to the new instruction. And then an important thing to note is you disable all interrupts of lower priority. Like for instance, if one interrupt was um, uh, go turn off the sink, if the sink's on, and the other interrupt was leave the house because it's on fire. When that interrupt gets fired off, you leave the house and the sink interrupt is disabled. You no longer care about that. And you go only to higher priority tasks. That interrupt can only be then interrupted by something of an even higher priority. Like reset, for example. Reset is like one of the highest priority interrupts you have. Uh, and then the registers are saved before running the ISR, so all your variables and such are pushed to the stack and that's saved. Then you go to the ISR, the ISR is run, and then the register will then pop back from the stack once that's finished, and you know you restore the state you're in. And the interrupt label, uh, sorry, interrupt that were lower priority levels are all re-enabled so that everything goes back to normal. Right, so on some processors, like that whole situation of um, saving the registers and stuff, like in 140 and MIPS, you have to do that manually. But here, uh, some of it's manually done sometimes, but for ours, it's automatically handled, which I think was an intentional choice of processors uh, on the LPZ 17XX. And here's a quick example of how the, the program flow will work with the interrupt. So you're going through the program, you get, you get uh, an interrupt triggered, so then you go to the interrupt handler for this one. And as you're going through this interrupt, let's say an interrupt of a higher priority happens, that one interrupts again, same situation, everything's pushed to the stack like we mentioned previously. This is run, things are restored, you finish running this, this is finished, and then you go back to the main task and it continues running on, and so on and so forth. Any questions thus far? Oh, we have questions. So. Uh, so, like if you're looking at the and then the reset drum, does that erase everything you just already entered? Yeah, uh, so um, let's say you get a reset ISR. It depends on how you wrote your reset ISR, because you actually have to write that as well. Um, the implementation for the SJ Dev in actually most environments is uh, one of the first things you do, or actually in our case especially, one of the first things we do, we actually reset the stack pointers all the way back up to the top of the stack so we can reutilize all that space. So the contents might still be there, but we want to make sure we start fresh. So we go back up to the top of RAM, we start allocating stuff that way. There's some other steps that kind of happen with, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of a reset, or um, yeah, the beginning of the reset stage before we call main, but there's a lot of, but that's what is happening. So in a sense, not, not everything got cleared out, but a lot of actions do end up happening during the ISR reset. Reset's kind of a nuke. But okay. All right, so nested vector of interrupt controller. So the cool thing about this is you can handle multiple interrupts, like the number of interrupts uh, implemented in the de is device dependent, but you can have more than one. I think some of them, some things were like dependent on number of pins. But anyway, you can have more than one interrupt. The programmable priority level for each interrupt. So you can, uh, they give you a list of, um, Interrupt signals that you can program the priority for, those are the maskable interrupts. So you can manually set them to be higher or lower than each other. There's some that you can't 
set the priority for that are like system level stuff like the M uh, NMI and the reset and stuff, but that's aside from those. Uh, level and pulse detection of interrupt signals. So level detection is when a signal goes high and it's asserted, if the interrupt service routine finishes before the, the level goes back down, it will uh, run that interrupt service routine again. Whereas pulse is what you would traditionally think of an interrupt is the signal goes high. Um, and I think for the safety for this is it has to go for a clock, uh, two clock cycles or a clock cycle to make sure that it's not just a random spike. And then once it sees that, it will do the interrupt service or do the interrupt uh, and all that stuff. Then the grouping of priority values into group priorities and set priority fields. So you're gonna have interrupts of the same priority levels uh, grouped together that they don't like uh, jump the gun on each other. And you have um, each interrupt has set priority fields. So when they're running at the same time, they it's not like um, undefined the behavior. It's it's more known to the developer. And then we have interrupt ta tail chaining. You can so skip that one. Let's yeah. skip that one. That's the NMI. And uh, an external non-maskable interrupt. So those are, like I said, the NMI. It's stuff that they keep it safe. Like you shouldn't be able to say don't reset. So here's an example. So a little, little part on the NMI. Um, some people in the previous class asked like, why it's called non-maskable. Um, it's similar to the whole idea of what, of what bit masking is. Oh, was that a question about desk? No, no. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, you, guys, you guys went over that whole thing over before, right? Okay. Yep. Well, there's probably some people who took uh, 127 with other professors, so just make sure. It's similar to the name of like uh, of like normal bit masking, where you want to ignore all sets of these bits and then have a certain bit uh, fall out. In this case, non-maskable means that you cannot you cannot ignore this particular interrupt. It must be invoked. So if it occurs, there is no disable interrupt for NMI. Although you can just not ever enable NMI, and then you can. Uh, then you end up never running that call. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, well, in this case, right, is it a case of like you have versions of maskable interrupts and then each, each of those interrupts in the maskable class is not like a certain priority level of users? Yeah, correct, actually. Uh, want to say that? No, I'm good. You should, yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> So, so with the NVIC system, a nested vector interrupt uh, controller, and we're gonna go into this, like, I'll, I'm actually gonna ask you guys a question about, actually, we're gonna answer this question in a sec, and I'm gonna ask a question that'll kind of bring this out. So, continue on for this, this little example here. Sure, so this example just shows what happens when you have interrupt uh, of different priority levels. So in the main routine, um, interrupt A gets hit, right? So the request happens, you go to interrupt A, and then in the middle of interrupt A, interrupt B of a higher priority, which we're assuming, uh, gets called. So you have to go jump and then you go to interrupt B. It gets its stuff uh, run and then in the middle of interrupt B you have interrupt C fired off but it's a lower priority than B or A. So it's ignored for a while, it's pending. So you keep going, returns to A and it sees that interrupt C is still a lower priority level than A so you finish A, return to the main program and then immediately go to interrupt C. That gets processed and then it goes back to the main program continuing on. So yeah, just keeping track of your interrupt priority levels so you know what the behavior is going to be like. So before we go on to like the, the hardware software connection the, uh, and the vector tables like that, I want to ask you guys a question, which is, what are some, what is a bad situation? So let's say we have, a, we have an interrupt controller, but it cannot nest and has no priorities. What are some bad scenarios that can happen from this? Like a safety interrupt that comes in, and yeah. then what, 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 what would happen? What do you, what, like, give me a scenario where like that could be probably dangerous to the individual. So if you're on a highway and like a, the other car makes a mistake, it doesn't see you, it doesn't see your driving, it doesn't see your blind spot. The car can just move away to another lane. Okay. If okay. Good. So if we all, if, and uh, this is a, this assumption is that we're already running some other interrupt, correct? Yeah. yeah. So in this particular case, we have a car. It got some interrupt signal from some signal somewhere in the car. Let's say it was. Uh, the fact that your phone connected over Bluetooth to the speaker, okay? But then there is the, uh, let's say you're on autopilot and then one of the uh, interrupts for the ultrasound, or sorry, ultrasonic sensors comes back. It says, hey, there's a car way too close to us. We should do this procedure. If we don't have the ability to nest or have any priority levels, that interrupt won't happen until we're done pairing with our phone. And then we might have already gotten a hit. That could be some money. Maybe we die. A lot of things could happen. So now let's say... We've added in uh, nesting. So we've added in nesting now. 
Can you guys give me a scenario where now we've got an essay, we don't have priorities, what problem could, that, could occur? Precisely. So, um, we might have some some important routine currently running, and then some other non-important routine comes in and uh, stops you from doing so. A good example of that. Oh, yes. We are the ones who say, like, you know, I subjectively feel that when the emergency button's pressed, that it has higher priority than when I needed to send like a, a text message over my like Wi-Fi connection. For example, I mean, let, let me give you one example that would be a clear distinction between what's important and what's not. Um, uh, you, have, you have two roommates, two dudes, and uh, one of them comes and says, bro, like, the house is on fire. And you're like, oh, crap, okay, let's do something about this. Let's get out the, let's get out the, the, fire, uh, like the fire extinguisher. And then your other friend comes in and is like, yo, man, I can't find my cat. Like, can you help me out? Like, I, I'm trying to find it. And then you immediately go, yeah, actually, yeah, let's go find your cat. A uh, <laughs> couple things that could go wrong here. Obviously, your house is on fire, and you could burn to death. And if the cat is stuck somewhere inside the house, it could burn to death too. So it would have been better off to just take on the fire thing before you go on the task of trying to figure out where the guy's cat is. So that could, that could go wrong when we, have, when we don't have a priority system. We don't have our priority straight. Once you add in priorities, this kind of fixes itself. So now I can go, OK, yeah, I understand, cat, uh, but fire. I need to go fix that, get extinguisher, get rid of that issue. Um, same thing with the autonomous car vehicle problem. Or same thing with an emergency button on a, on a robot. Yes? Wait, so, so nesting without priority or with no, priority? Mm, so yes, first come, first serve, yes. Um, without priority, it is uh, last come, <laughs> last serve, or is the one that gets served first. And if you have priority without nesting, um, guess you have a bad, uh, a bad scenario, a scenario with that? Yeah, well, so, so, so priority, no nesting. Perfect. So it's kind of like it's kind of like it's very similar to the case where you didn't have nesting. I'm sorry, where you didn't have priorities. Now, like you know, you're waiting to get this thing done before you can go back. The system evaluates. Oh yeah, yeah. So airbags thing, got to do that, and then it initiates that one. That time difference could have been, you know, a lifesaver, to like uh, life not stage. So what's the difference between? Like, oh, you said they're very similar, but what's the difference? Yeah, let me draw it up a little bit. Let's draw it up. Skills <laughs> um, in one case, we have our code. We have it spawn off. So we go back up to here, to here, to here, back up to here. So this is, let's say, the case where you know we have um, no nesting but prior, but like we have a prior system. So you know that when we get here, actually, let me write one other thing here goes here and then goes off to some other task. This ISR here is airbags. This one right here is uh, Bluetooth. Oops. Right here we get the airbag um, ISR to say, hey, we need to do something about this. But we wait because we need to finish up our, our Bluetooth connection. And then eventually we come back to here, and let's see if we get some other one. We get like another higher priority, like another lower priority one, which is like, you know, uh, stereo button pressed. So button pressed. We get a couple other ones in here. Once, we're, once we leave back from here, we reevaluate which is the next interrupt to run, and we go and run this one. That time difference might have been the difference between life or death. Whereas in the case where you have uh, nesting but no, uh, but no uh, priorities, you go like this, go out like this. Is that true? This. So you jump over to this set of code, and you start to go through this, then you jump again, and you jump again to get to this one, then you go back to this one, and go back to this one, and it goes back. So what's happening is, let's say this is the ISR for uh, your airbags. You haven't deployed them all the way by the time you got a Bluetooth connection or a button press. You go do the button press, then someone presses another button because you're trying to change the AC on your car. Then you go over to another ISR, 
And all the whilst, you should have actually turned on your airbags. Or possibly moved out of the way during autonomous vehicle. Or potentially, you know, geared, uh, set up like, uh, does something with the engine to not have it rev so fast, or, you know, do some other type of optimization there. So here's the issue with not, with not, with having priorities, but no nesting. Here's the issue when you have nesting, uh, with no priorities. You combine them together, you get the best of both worlds, and usually, if you prioritize properly, uh, your system will work properly. Does that answer your guys' question? All right, take it away. All righty. Multiple unit processing. All right, software to hardware connections. So now that you guys know how it basically works, you have to tell the CPU where the ISR needs to jump to, or where, sorry, where the ISR is to jump to. So that's using the interrupt vector table. And as you can see here, you got these exception numbers. And the highest ones are reset MI and the hard fault, stuff that isn't uh, maskable. Then you have like um, high priority stuff like memory management, et cetera, et cetera. And all the way down here, then you got the reserved, and then you got the programmable ones after that. So you got the programmable um, general, what's called uh, interrupts from over there. So those are the ones that we get to play with. Let's see something here, example. Uh, they're using a linker script and compiler directors. Yeah, so in order to uh, use the interrupts, you got to enable them first. So here's a quick example. And the interrupt stuff over here is basically a uh, vector table that you got to uh, enable stuff in. Give you guys just a little, a little bit more on this. This is basically the hardware, the hardware's lookup table for which ISR to run when that interrupt occurs. All right. So it's all set up already. Um, and just yeah, stuff. So the, yeah, like it says, it's a vector table. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, vector lookup table for the hardware that util uh, utilizes it. And there's technically two methods to set up an ISR uh, on the SJ1. So first you got to enable it using the NVIC, en um, whatever, NVIC enable function. Uh, and it points to where the IRQ number is. So that's the same for both methods. But method one is actually modifying the, uh, the vector table, the interrupt vector table. So it's in red because it's like, you don't generally want to do this. Like, let's say you modify your header or your file and then you're working with partners later on and you try to transfer code over, it's not gonna work because they didn't modify their file and it's just gonna be a huge mess. And even if it's just, it's not a good idea, like why would you do that? I don't, <laughs> like, I don't know a situation where it's better to do that. Uh, yeah, so like, like, if you know like the thing that you're putting in there, like is, is the only thing you're gonna put in that IBT, like for example, when I'm setting up the framework for this, um, I know that I'm gonna put like, the some of the functions, some of the methods that are run by for our task, I'm gonna place those there. I'm not ever gonna change them out, so I can place them on there and not have to worry about it. That's consistent for all projects. But if something you put in for the ISR uh, for the ISR um, function table, like uh, lookup uh, uh, IVT, is not gonna be across all projects. It should not be put in there. So like if you're setting up the reset or what? If you are, um, yeah, yeah. So reset would be in there. Yeah. Um, for our stuff would be in there. Uh, hard fault handler, like handlers for exceptions, so like that should be in there. Otherwise, if not project wide, they should not be in the uh, IBT. Cool. I'm sorry, uh, library wide. Like, so like all projects that ever run your SJ1 will have it in there. So. Okay, and then, so it's, it's showing you how to, we're still showing you how to do it anyway, but like let's say you want to mo modify it, you go over here, you go to this table, and then this is all the same, and over here, like notice he changed it over here, like he changed one of them from being ISR forwarded routine to specifically what ISR he wanted to do. He named it run my ISR for that interrupt, um, which makes it less dynamic as it was mentioned before and causes a ton of headaches. It's just not really a great idea, but it is out there, like you should know about it. Right, method two, the ISR register functions. So the um, enable interrupt three IRQ symbol is defined in the enumeration in the LPC 17xx.h file. Similar to how your other registers are defined, you can look them up and find which ones you want to use. Uh, and like it says, all you need to do is specify the IRQ number and the uh, function you want to act as an ISR, and that will tell the the, uh, the CPU where to jump to and what ISR function to run. Uh, I think we'll mention it later. I don't know when it, is it mentioned here to keep it short? Or um, I don't know if it actually says to keep it short anywhere, but in case it doesn't, you, you want to keep your... Um... Yeah, it does, it does. Okay, cool. It will tell you later. Right, this is the one that we normally want to use, uh, and this is the better one. So as you can see here, you want to use um, that interrupt. So 
in that interrupt service routine, you want to do something, and then you want to clear the interrupt flag afterwards. In the main, what you do is you go load the um, uh, the interrupt number and then the uh, uh, and the vector table as well as the routine, and then you enable that uh, interrupt using that function. It's also easier to see because you can see it in your main search, so you know what's going on. Oh, the weak function override template. So, um, oh, wait, no. Anyway. Kind of like the first copy of Argon over. Uh, yeah. yeah. What to do inside of I, oh, sweet, so it does tell you. Right, so don't do a lot in the ISR. If you're writing to a file like text or something computationally heavy-ish like that, you generally shouldn't be using the ISR for that. So when you're inside the ISR, the whole system is blocked, uh, other than, obviously other than the high priority interrupts, but again, not the greatest idea to do for a long period of time. And if you spend too much time inside the ISR, you're destroying the real-time operating system's principle, and generally things get clogged up because you block the entire system. Um, so just to reiterate this, yeah. so like I guess, uh, so say it twice so you guys know that you understand this part. Uh, Fair test is almost always put as the lowest priority task. I'm sorry, lowest priority interrupt. So that ISR tick is the lowest priority. When your ISR is running, it stops all tasks from running because Fair test cannot can no longer run. So get through your ISR as quickly as possible so that you can allow the rest of your tasks to continue to run yeah. in a timely manner. There's, there's ways to use interrupts to enable functions to do longer tasks, but it's not the interrupt service routine that's actually going to do it, but we'll probably get to that later. Anyway, reiterating again, keeping short as possible, don't pull for things inside an interrupt service routine because that makes it wait potentially indefinitely in an interrupt service routine. Uh, yeah, printing data over UART can freeze the entire system because UART is interrupt driven. Uh, including the RTOS for that duration. So, like, even printing four characters uh, takes an entire millisecond at uh, 38400 PPS, which is not seemingly a lot, but in CPU each terms, yeah. it's a lot. And each tick is one op is is one is one millisecond. So, you try to print like more than like let's say a whole sentence. That is a whole bunch of tasks that are no, that are now delayed from actually being able to run properly. Right. RTOS API calls. All right. So if you are using the free, uh, free RTOS API calls, uh, you must use the from ISR functions only. If a from ISR function does not exist, then don't use that API. Clear interrupt sources, right. So clear the source of the interrupt. Uh, if the interrupt was for rising edge of plan, clear the rising edge uh, bit such that you will not re-enter the same interrupt function. What that means is don't, like if it has to be rising edge to activate the interrupt and you leave it like that, it's gonna keep running the interrupt until that thing is deserted or just whatever, turned off, you know what I'm saying? And if it's low, same thing, turn it high to keep it from continuously running that interrupt surface gene after it finishes the interrupt. Processing, uh, I start processing the setup you are test to ask. Probably have ISR exit quickly like we mentioned and then resume a task or thread to uh, process the event. So this is kind of how to use the interrupt uh, to do a little bit of a longer task. So, for example, if we want to write to a file upon a button press, we don't want to do that inside the ISR because that takes forever and, yeah, like we said, blocks the system. So, lo looping back to the semaphores that we mentioned earlier, we can use that ISR or interrupt service routine to provide that semaphore to something rather or, or create the semaphore or whatever you, what have you, rather than it do the entire function itself. So it enables the function using an interrupt that happens upon an interrupt um, but it doesn't actually run all within the interrupt. You're using a semaphore to enable a function uh, based on that. Now, are you the example low is what you do? Uh, you're not processing the ISR immediately and therefore delay the processing, but you can take this scenario by resuming a highest priority task. So I mentioned earlier when you have, um, depending on the uh, task priority level that you have the semaphore for, you can use it to your advantage. So if we feed the semaphore to a higher priority task, uh, which will enable it to be running, which will make it ready, that will then not interrupt it, but it was, it's still, you're still using RTOS, but it's the one being serviced because it's a high priority and it is now enabled. Uh, and it happens immediately at the ISR's exit because it's the highest priority task. So, yeah. Uh, do the ISR yield it? Yeah. It, right. Any questions thus far? So here's kind of the example. So we have the semaphore created in main, uh, and then we have the ISR, which basically over here gives the semaphore. Uh, when it uses a special sum for it's given from ISR. And then you have the another special plan called the port yield from the ISR function. But basic syntax is pretty intuitive. So in the um, in the button press, so uh, it basically, whatever, whatever, yeah, 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 process, yeah, it processes the interrupt upon the button press. So the interrupt is sent on the button press and allowing you to enable the, um, uh, the, the task down here in the main. And as you can see, the button press uh, creates the binary set for 
which will allow the task to run. So you get it. Yeah. You want to go to the lab? Yeah, let's go into the lab. Um, any questions as we transition over? Uh, your computer handles like a three-legged pig. Your computer handles like a three-legged pig? I can't drive. Okay. So your lab assignment includes interrupts, lookup tables, and binary semaphores. Who would have guessed? Uh, the objective is to create a dynamic, user-defined, interrupt service routine callback driver library. Put all the buzzwords in there. Just threw them all in there. Yeah. Where's the blockchain? Yeah. You know, so, so we, we, we've included blockchain technology and cloud computing as well as machine learning and special, specially defined lookup table technologies in order to bring to you guys. Yeah. Okay, oh, I forgot about wearable nanotech. Forgot about that part. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm, so what? No, exactly, exactly. All utilizing our proprietary uh, cryptocurrency. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, so, so utilize semaphores, lookup tables, function pointers, and interrupts. We'll have a couple of uh, interrupt uh, registers that you have to look into. So if you look into table 103, it's kind of hard to see. Um, you'll find the registers for interrupt. That's kind of hard to see but on the screen there. Make it a little bigger. A little easier to see. Uh, you'll see interrupt enable rising. So you can enable interrupts for rising edges on pins, falling edges on pins. If you enable them both, you got both rising and falling. So you just wait for them to change. You can also set up, you can also read back if a particular GPIO rose or if it fell from the int stat r register or the int stat fall f register. Now, one of the things that we talked about was that uh, you had to uh, you had to also clear interrupt before you finish your ISR. Um, you need, 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 need to clear it. If you do not clear it, you'll be stuck in an infinite loop because you'll eventually leave your ISR. Then it'll say, hey, you still got an ISR there and then go back to into the ISR. So you'll use the interrupt clear uh, register in order to clear your ISR. And then you'll use the int status to see if whether or not there was one. This is actually based off of which port you're on. Now, notice how these ones are read only, these ones write only. Uh, you can only uh, read from this. There's no reason to write to it. And you can only write to this one. Once you write to it, it'll be written to. Similar to the GPIO ports and pins, you'll see that there is a IO0 interrupt rising. So this would be for all port 0 GPIO. And then its, it's, uh, it's bit index, its bit position, represents which pin you're trying to uh, set as interrupt rising following, so on and so forth. Make sense? All right, your assignment, part zero, simple interrupt implementation. So you're going to start off with just getting interrupts to work. There's no real requirement for this particularly, but if you don't get that to work, obviously you can't finish with the rest of the assignments. We have a bit of starter code here, so a way to register an ISR. Um, and then we have a while loop here in the main, so the main doesn't return. Uh, returning from main, uh, in, in embedded systems, you should never return from main. Here you'll register this one for eint3 irq. I don't know why they named it this way for the 17 uh, for the LPC 17xx. In the LPC 40xx architecture, they call it the proper name, which is GPIO IRQ. So the GPIO um, interrupt is called ENT3 for some reason. External interrupt three, but there's also external interrupt zero, one, and two, which are all specific pins. Whereas this one handles is a blanket for all GPIO. Okay, so. If this interrupt ever occurs, you have to find which GPIO occurred using the registers above. And then from there, clear that particular one and then run whatever you like to run based off that which pin executed. Um, before I go any further, one of the things you might want to do is simply print out a message to say like, hey, there's something here. Obviously, we talked about don't print out messages inside interrupts. This is for testing. Print out a message. And once you have the first step, which is to say, okay, I got interrupts working, I got the message printed, awesome. Make sure that it returns, so you can print out some messages here, put a delay in there, put a, a delay M a MS in there, and make sure that you continually uh, print more messages. Now you can raise interrupts and print out a particular message. Then make sure that you can appropriately do it for not just one pin, but for multiple pins. So let's say another pin. Once you have that pattern down, move on to the next step, which is you start to design the GPIO interrupt driver. 
In this case, implement all methods. Uh, all methods must uh, function as expected by their comment description. So you're still given a lot for this particular task as well. You will be given an enumeration. Uh, I really should rename this. I don't like how I named it in the past. But basically, we have enum interrupt condition, k rising edge, k falling edge, k uh, both edges. If you're asking why the k is in front of this, because I'm at Google, and that's what we do for all our constants in C++. Uh, I'm just used to writing it that way. Rather than having to write out uh, this all this junk here, you can type def the function on pointer. So you can just write it like this. And now you have your ISR pointer map. So you have a couple of methods in here you can read about what they're supposed to do and what they're supposed to be. And then when you hit this point here, it'll kind of give you more explanation here as well. Um, but as you can tell, I kind of gave you a pattern here. 2 by 32. Take the hint what I'm trying to get at here. All right. And you can read the rest of this stuff too in order to get the understanding for how the rest is supposed to go. So... One of these, uh, one of these, uh, when you run your, uh, there's one particular method that you have to implement, which is the attach interrupt handler, which will include a port, a pain, and a callback function, as well as a condition. You should be able to handle rising, falling, or both. Uh, when that particular pin gets, uh, once you set up the pin to be rising or falling, whatever one it's supposed to be, whenever those conditions happen, that hardware interrupt will occur, your ISR will run. And then you'll be in your ISR, and then you'll have to run that particular procedure. Find which pin, uh, uh, which pin uh, was the one is the one that caused the interrupt. Clear that particular condition, and then return. Okay. Extra credit. I'll go into what the requirements are for this in a sec. The extra credit for this is to optimize your GPI application. So you guys ought to write uh, like logic in order to make the pressing release happen, right? But Think about this for a second. What did, like, if you look at the waveform for a button, if you did a press and then a release, what does that kind of look like? Can I, can I, can I see, like, what, we're kind of like drawing it like this. What does it look like? What do we call that in 124? It's not a clock. Pulse. Not a, well, it is a, it, not, it's not really a pulse, because what if it's just like, and then it just goes down once? What is it? Square. No, because you need, you need multiple cycles to make a square. Just, it's an edge. It's an edge. Which type of edge? Uh, falling edge. So rather than doing any logic, just set up that particular pin as a falling edge, and then that uh, that handles the rest for you. Just wait for the interrupt to occur, and then you just clear it when it happens. Make the make the hardware do all the logic for you. You don't have to write all that stuff yourself. Waste uh, bytes and bits trying to store your variables and doing some comparisons. Now the requirements are. You should be able to specify a callback function for any port or pin exposed by the GPIO for rising, falling, or both edges. Now, when I say every pin, I mean port 0 and port 2. Port 1 does not allow it, and all other ports don't allow it either. I may ask you to reflash your code. Make sure you can flash. Reflash your code to prove that if you take a particular pin and you're having it on falling edges, that it can, be, it can work with rising edges. I'm going to take you, all right, now switch the number to another pin and see if that works there. Um, in this particular case, I want you to use two external um, buttons. You can also just use a jumper if you want to. Just jumper the two wires together, like, you know, connect to power ground. Be careful not to destroy your board. Um, but if you want to, it's a little easier to work with uh, two switches. Um, and the reason I have to both be external is because the switches that are on board your, uh, your board are um, port one, which don't have any interrupts. Um, and you must demonstrate the use of semaphores from ISR to communicate with a B control LED task. Well, actually, I need to remove this one to uh, uh, to not really require B, uh, B control LED because it's supposed to be extra credit. But um, I'll make this addition um, tomorrow. Okay. Do not use printf within an ISR. That will cause the system to usually freeze. Um, use u0 debug printf from the printf libh. Um, you have some more skeleton code here. Into what to turn in. Uh, when it comes to screenshots, you don't really need any screenshots for this. If you have any relevant screenshots you'd like to sh share, that's fine. But it should all be within a single PDF. For all your code that you built, put it all in one PDF, submit that, make sure it is properly formatted. Okay, I'll probably put this in another announcement tomorrow. But make sure that your, your, your code is formatted properly. Okay. Uh, we need that at a time. One of the things we have to do after this is get you guys set up into groups. Um, uh, can you get that rolling a little bit? But before we go there, 
Are there any questions? Okay. Stand up, stand up. Um, any questions? Yes, do next week. That one week. Once you get interrupts working for like the one plus one case, the rest should be pretty simple. Uh, if you want to get inside that, that particular, uh, well, actually, once you get it working one plus one, and you get the, like the function, the uh, lookup table working, it should be pretty simple after that point. Yes? No, no. Um, if you want to do the extra credit, uh, the extra credit does not require that you utilize uh, like your own driver for this one. So you can use the GPI driver if you'd like to. Um, but like I said before, in the beginning of the class, which is the driver that you design for this class will be used for your project. So if you have not finished the GPIO lab, it is imperative that you go and finish that, or else you can't use GPIOs for the Review project, and I'm pretty certain it's impossible without having uh, GPI access. Any other questions? Uh, well, oh, one other question? I was going to say, can we like modify the old GPI driver for the use of lookup tables like you suggested at the beginning of this lecture? Yeah, absolutely. I highly recommend modifying them. If you ever learn like a new trick, you're like, oh, that's really cool. I should update my pre previous drivers to include this. I highly encourage you to do so. So do they come up one at a time now? Yeah, so uh, groups of people come up here. We'll get you guys set up as a group. Uh, yes, we're just missed after that. If you need any help, I'll, I'll be staying around a little bit later, uh, a little bit afterward to help you out. What's the, what's the group set? Oh, no, no. That's how, that's how you create a group set. Uh, group name. That's that's group name. 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 Typing with two fingers? There's no, the real uh, life situation. Oh, oh, dude, uh, if something's uh, not broken, bubble it's not worth the cost. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> 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 <laughs>